Thanks. Welcome to our live event with Mr. Brandon Napier. Mr. Napier will show, share with us the history of our region and also the history of the Southwest Virginia Museum. Mr. Napier is a 2008 graduate of Lee High School. He has been employed as a park interpreter for Southwest Virginia Museum since August 2016. Mr. Brandon Napier. Thank you. <clears throat> On. Yep. Here hey everybody, uh, thanks for having me here. Like this young gentleman said, I am a graduate of Lee High School and I work at the Southwest Virginia uh, Museum in Big Stone Gap. And I'm here to talk about the history of Southwest Virginia plus the history of our museum because it's a very neat site, what type of programming we do and you know what all we have up there. So first I'd like to do a quick overview on Southwest Virginia. Uh, we are located in a very uh, mountainous region in the state of Virginia. It's uh, the far western part of the Commonwealth, and it is a very remote and rugged area, and it's uh, quite different from the rest of the state where we have, you know, the plain, just rolling hills, and then uh, the beach area. Uh, Southwest Virginia is very rural, and its early economy really was mo uh, economy was mainly focused on agricultural pursuits. Um, when I was younger, tobacco was huge, especially here in Lee County, and uh, it kind of phased out, and it used to be all of Southwest Virginia's main cash crop. Also, um, in the early 20th century, coal mining was a giant part of the Southwest Virginia economy, and a lot of our culture is based around that. Um, and we're starting to see some more mines opening back up. Um, if you if you could think, actually, um, St. Charles, which is um, kind of a smaller area, used to be a booming, booming town back in the heyday, so in the 1940s and the 1950s. And Keoki, which is uh, very rural now, used to have tons of houses and um, areas for um, recreation and tons of coal mines through there. And um, as of the early 90s, uh, with the decline of the coal jobs and tobacco as a cash crop, uh, Southwest Virginia has looked to uh, try to uh, boost the economic development and has mainly focused on tourism. So um, we have a lot of very talented people here in Southwest Virginia. So um, their tourism is being based on all the crafts, our music, which is um, very, very important to the, re uh, the region, agritourism, which is, you know, uh, tourism that's based on agricultural pursuits and outdoor recreations because we live in some of the most beautiful mountains in the world and there's all sorts of fun things you can do. Um, one of the big things, especially here in Lee County, is the Crooked Road. Uh, at the Lee Theater they do Crooked Road events so it just celebrates the history of mountain music and how that mountain music affected all of our culture um, and people come from all over the world to um, you know, hear our mountain music. One of the big names in particular oh. is Dr. Oh. Ralph Stanley, uh, which I'm sure almost everyone's heard of. Um, it didn't make it uh, we're going to talk about the history of Southwest Virginia settlement. It was along the last part of the state to be settled, and area this area inhabited um, by different tribes of Native Americans, including the Cherokees. I'm sure you heard about the uh, archaeological dig at Pennington Middle School where they found some remains of early, early Cherokee um, civilization that was up to 10,000 years old. That is incredible. Such a great find to find in our county. And the first Europeans uh, to come into the Southwest Virginia area were Spanish explorers in the mid-1500s who were looking for gold and silver. And then, as time come on, more English explorers came in the 1600s and then to the mid-1700s. One of the uh, big explorers that we celebrate here in Lee County is the, Dr. Thomas Walker. Uh, Dr. Thomas Walker explored what's called the Cumberland Gap region of the county in about 1750. And as people started to come uh, explore more, we had a flow of migrations that consisted uh, mainly of English, German, and Scotch-Irish folks coming uh, to the nooks and crannies and hollers of Southwest Virginia because it reminded them so much of their homeland. Uh, next up on the agenda is the Wilderness Road, which is a um, very historical uh, significant area and uh, is right through Lee County and Scott County. 
uh, the Wilderness Road was blazed by none other than Daniel Boone, and at um, one of our other uh, state parks in the county, or the state uh, Wilderness Road State Park, you can actually visit a preserved section of the Wilderness Road. Uh, there's also a replica of Martin Station Fort at Wilderness uh, Road State Park, which is very cool. The route began at a um, sacred place to the natives in Kingsport, which was called Long Island, and um, kind of made its way through Scott County, over and up the mountain, uh, it goes into uh, Lee County from Duffield, and then all the way through Lee County into uh, the Cumberland Gap region, and then into Kentucky. The Wilderness Road was very rugged, and uh, there were many hardships faced on it. It was also very dangerous. Attacks from Native Americans were common, and um, there were also criminals and robbers who would hide out on the uh, Wilderness Road and ambush uh, families as they went by. Do you help down there too? I know. You just based out of Big Stone? Uh, yeah, just in Big Stone. Okay. Uh, one uh, neat fact was that Daniel Boone's son was actually um, killed in a um, Native American attack in around present-day Stickleyville, uh, which was a, where the Wilderness Road went through. There are many forts that were constructed for safety of the travelers along the Wilderness Road. And um, Lee County used to be very, very big, and so did Wise County. But many of the present-day counties were formed from the larger counties, which were, uh, they were broken up as the population in the region continued to grow. Fast forward a few years to the Civil War. This area was very deeply divided between uh, Union and Confederate um, um, uh, people um, because um, it wasn't a very um, plantation area. So as the whole state of Virginia was Confederate, there were a lot of pro-Union forces in the area. Uh, many small skirmishes happened uh, throughout Southwest Virginia in the Civil War. The area was subject to guerrilla warfare, which means um, soldiers were frequently ambushed in the area. At the far west end of Lee County uh, lies the Cumberland Gap, uh, where it meets Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia, and that was a very prime area during the Civil War. Many skirmishes were fought over this area, and it exchanged hands four times. Uh, in 1863, finally, the Union kept control. The biggest battle in Southwest Virginia during the Civil War was the Battle of Saltville. Saltville is a few hours northeast of here, and uh, it's actually named for the uh, salt deposits in the area, and salt was very important in the Civil War. Here's one question. Yes, if they pop up a question, I'll... I'll okay. But I think you just said, talked about this. They said, did you mention Daniel Boone's son being killed near here? You did, uh, yes. didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Okay, I thought you. I thought you. I got. I got it. <laughs> so let me mute them. Ely Dale's excited. <laughs> Meredith is excited. She got Ely Dale in. Okay, I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead. You're all good. Um, so, like I was saying, yeah, the biggest battle um, during the Civil War that was fought in Southwest Virginia was in Saltville, and uh, salt was a very essential mineral for food preservation, but also for medical reasons. And uh, now on, we're gonna hop into the geography of Southwest Virginia. Like I said, we're located in some of the most beautiful mountains on the world, the Appalachian Mountains. And the Appalachian Mountains have the most direct impact on the geography of Southwest Virginia and are often credited for isolating its residents from the rest of the Commonwealth. Southwest Virginia falls into the Ridge and Valley province of Virginia as well as the Blue Ridge uh, province in Virginia. Within the mountains, the coal fields has been one of the like I was saying earlier, coal fields have been one of the sources of significant economic booms in the region. And uh, we have tons of little rivers and creeks, but the uh, major river in the region is the New River, which is also one of the oldest rivers in the world. And it actually flows north uh, instead of south, which is very um, different. Do, uh, one of them said, do you know, can you tell them more about Daniel Boone's children? No, uh, no. don't. Yes. Sorry, I didn't uh, No, that's okay. Yeah. They'll, they'll ask you anything, yeah. too, though, so you just... Uh, Southwest Virginia also has a lot of public lands, which are um, managed by a variety of different um, government agencies, and they provide uh, opportunities to um, anyone to experience the region's natural beauty. Uh, hiking is very big, so is biking and backpacking, and kayaking are they're so popular, and I can't encourage you all enough to get out and, you know, give it a shot and spend time in nature. 
Some notable examples of Southwest Virginia recreation destinations are the uh, Virginia Tree, uh, Creeper Trail, which is starts in Abington and then goes to Damascus and then goes to the top of White Top Mountain, which borders North Carolina. So you can uh, catch a bus in Abington or Damascus and they'll take you up to the very top of it and they'll let you ride down it. Um, it's very neat. It's uh, where an old train was in the early 1900s. So there's all sort of, uh, or sorts of, um, <laughs> Uh, remade train trestles and just beautiful scenery and also uh, the new river is very big for uh, rafting and kayaking. Do I have any more questions on the history of Southwest Virginia before I go into the museum? Yeah and you may be going to tell she said is uh, Jonesville wants to know is the museum open on the weekends uh, how can they get notifications about special events there? Okay, yeah, I'm going to go into that. Uh, the museum, actually, um, we've been closed for, um, we're always closed the first two months of the year for maintenance reasons. We have to, you know, make sure we're uh, keeping um, up with the maintenance of the site because it's so very incredible and it's uh, irreplaceable. But the museum opens next Wednesday and you can um, uh, call up to the museum and we can send you a calendar in the mail or... Um, you can look on the state parks website and click on us and it has a calendar online that will show all the different events and um i really um like to encourage you know if there's any teachers that would like to uh, bring a school group up uh please call us and we can arrange that because um uh, the um it's a very neat historical area and uh just tells the story of our region and i'm sure you know uh, the children will benefit from coming up uh, Elton Knob has a student that wants to ask you a question. Is that okay? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so let me switch and get them up here. It's pretty neat. And let me unmute them. Let's see. This hops around sometimes and it's being crater. So can you see them there? I've got uh, them up. I and still they're... paused. Um, oh, has Freddie got it paused? Yeah. On that? Okay. Yeah, I can see. Oh, all right, I can hear you now. So um, go ahead and ask your question. We'll see if he can hear you. Um, I had a question about how many um, forts um, were along the trail? There were uh, several, several forts. And then there were probably, I believe, seven to eight forts in Lee County, but they're all, you know, spaced out for like an average day to day travel because no one really wanted to be on the road at night because the dangers of it from um, robbers and criminals to Native American attacks. Good job. Do, do you have another one? Uh, is there, no. any, is there oh, any other questions? Ask that question? no. I think they're being bashful. Okay. Thank you. I'll mute, I'll mute you back. And Thank we'll... you. All right. So on to our museum. Um, the uh, Southwest Virginia Museum Historic State Park um, was a um, Victorian era mansion in Big Stone. Construction of the house began in 1888 and was completed in about 1895. The cost of the house to build it was in that time $25,000, which isn't a lot of money nowadays, especially uh, when you go look at it, you'll really say, wow. The architect um, was Charles A. Johnson. The exterior of the building is made of sandstone and limestone that is actually quarried locally here in Big Stone Gap, or in Big Stone Gap and was hand chiseled. And then throughout the uh, inside of the museum, native red oak from Big Stone is used uh, for the doors and there are hand carved motifs uh, adorning all the windows and doors. And the woodwork is absolutely one of the most incredible things um, I've ever seen. We've got designs in the floor that you know were made over a hundred, almost 120 years ago, and the wood hasn't shifted. It's absolutely perfect. It is unreal. So in 1885, Rufus Ayers, who was the uh, who had the house built, uh, served as Virginia's Attorney General. He and other gentlemen, such as John M. Bowden, Charles Sears, and George Carter, felt that Big Stone Gap could become the Pittsburgh of the South because of its iron ore and coal deposits. Rufus was instrumental in helping develop the coal and iron ore industry in Southwest Virginia and bringing the railroads to this area. However, the Big Stone Gap did not become the next uh, big Pittsburgh area due to the economic depression in the region. 
The house was purchased in 1929 by a Lee County gentleman uh, who is very important named Seabasket Slim. He was born in an area near Seminary, which is on the east end of Lee County. Uh, Slim served many years in Congress and later became the private secretary to President Calvin Coolidge, which is uh, very neat. Uh, Seabass and Slim and his sister Janie Slim Newman had a love for Southwest Virginia and its people, history, and rich culture. They collected artifacts depicting life of the area, which were originally displayed in the Janie Slim Newman Museum. Before Seabaskin's death in 1943, he established the Slint Foundation, which gives uh, scholarships to children in our area. It was his last wish that the state acquire the heirs home from New York. And in 1944, the Southwest Virginia um, Museum was officially dedicated by the state on May 30th in 1948. The museum is managed by um, the Department of Conservation and Recreation's uh, Development of Southwest Virginia and the lives of, I think I missed one. That's okay. Yeah, uh, it's managed by the DCR, which is the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And the museum is um, there to depict the lives of what it was like in Southwest Virginia uh, in the early 1900s and late 1800s. The exhibits depict the boom and bust area, uh, boom and bust era of the late 1800s. Life at the turn of the century can be seen by such <laughs> items as mail order catalogs, photographs, radios. Artifacts from the early settlers who developed the area in the late 1700s are also the play, uh, on display. Also in the collection are rare pieces that Seabaskin and Janie acquired during their travels. The collection includes a set of Disraeli china, which Queen Victoria of England had made for her prime minister and also our very fine French paintings in a casson, which is an Italian hope chest, and antiques from the Orient. So we have a beautiful uh, sword from um, China that was hand carved. Um, mm. The handle is bone. It's been hand carved. We also have some very neat um, early Palestinian pottery that dates back to 2000 BC. So we have some incredible pieces. Mm. And we always have... Um, rotating exhibits at different libraries in the area. So uh, one of those will be, uh, we used to have one here at the Pennington. I'm sure we'll have one again coming soon, but you know, if you're in any other of the uh, regional libraries, we may have one there. Um, and our artifact collection hosts over 25,000 different artifacts. So that's wow, pretty that's incredible. Right. And um, at the museum, we have all sorts of neat programming. We have a monthly coffee house open mic night which gives people a chance to come and tell stories, play acoustic music. And that is the first Saturday of every month. So it'll actually start next Saturday. Hmm. It's free. Um, come out and, you know, see us and listen to some good music. We have also, when summer hits, our <clears throat> Lunch on the Lawn series, where we provide lunch um, for a small fee. And then we have a uh, musician book for an hour. So you can sit outside and enjoy... Um, you know, some uh, music and some good food and just, you know, it's a nice way to spend a Friday in the summer. Oh, on Friday night. And what time is it on in the summer? Uh, it'll be Friday during the day. In the oh, summer. during the day. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah. all that information will be on the website. Um, another big thing we're about to have is our Stitch in Time quilt show where people have a chance to display um, the quilts they make throughout the region. And we also display some of the quilts that we have in the museum's collection. Uh, I was going through some. We have some quilts that are from the 1840s, you know, some really incredible pieces. Yeah. Another big event is the Festival of Trees, which many of you all have been to, where we have 80 Christmas trees um, decorating the halls um, all throughout the museum. And they're from schools, organizations, churches, private families, and it's a beautiful way to see uh, the museum. And we offer night viewings in December which uh, is absolutely a beautiful way to, you know, check out the museum. Can anybody do that, the trees, until you get full? Uh, Any organization? We're or? full, but uh, if you want to contact the museum, we can put you on the waiting oh, list. Oh, okay, a waiting list to yeah, put your tree up. Wow. <laughs> um, also, that's, yeah, awesome. that's awesome. Yeah, around the holidays, we do a 
thing called breakfast with the Grinch. That's pretty neat. I've been so, to that. It um, was good. We have the Grinch come in and we read the Grinch and we serve green eggs and ham. Okay. And then um, we have tea with Mrs. Claus. So, you know, we have some traditional hot teas, some sandwiches. And Miss Claus makes her way down from the North Pole and tells stories and sings songs and tells us what Santa's been up to. So that's really neat. We do a monthly bus tour where we um, go to a um, area of um, historical significance or just other neat areas. And you can inquire about those. They change every month uh, if you call the museum. We do a music festival in uh, Labor Memorial Day weekend. Um, uh, where we have, you know, some bluegrass, and we get some big names, and that's very fun. Uh, we have the Hoots and Haints Halloween event, which is a free event, where we have a haunted area, we have games, candy, <clears throat> it's great fun for the kids. And then we have a monthly artisan series, where um, a local artist from the area comes, and they um, do some sort of craft. We've done wreath making, done card making, just anything, you know, neat. Hmm. Um, we also have a jams program where we teach uh, kids about and that's what Freddie's in Freddie yeah. Fields boys in that he's gonna play for us this afternoon oh, too. he's a great banjo yeah. player um, I didn't know we had all this stuff at the museum oh, so yeah. that's so awesome to learn it just about started this. so if any, <laughs> okay. you can uh, just call up to the museum and inquire about it uh, it's just an after-school program on Thursdays and we provide the instruments and everything and it's not very expensive so it's pretty neat and uh, that's about it. So, uh, any questions? Uh, everybody's just there listening. We're in between lunch and stuff. They're all just listening. The Daniel Boone one was the only one. So, but uh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing about the teachers being able to, uh, school groups being able and having all these new things to, to offer. So, we really appreciate you uh, being here with us today. And all right. Thank well, you. I thank you all very much. You come up and see us sometime, okay?